This is the result of exodus, exodus from the family farms of America. And when the independent farmer leaves the land and makes his way to the urban areas, the independent rural businessman loses a customer. And soon the businesses of rural America are deserted too. What's really tragic about this loss of 2,500 farms a week is that it doesn't have to happen, but it will, unless farmers themselves prevent it by doing something about declining farm prices, a decline that's driving families off farms at the highest rate in history. A four-year-old who wants to be a family farmer like his dad is going to be fighting terrible odds. Because if things keep going as they are, by the time a four-year-old is 18, there'll be over 1,800,000 fewer farms to farm on. Mr. Wilson Johnson, president of the National Federation of Independent Business, is our guest on U.S. Farm Report and will discuss the problems we have just posed. So stay tuned. <laughs> everybody and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. It is my pleasure today to welcome as a special guest to our show a visitor from San Mateo, California. I'm speaking of Mr. Wilson S. Johnson who is president of the National Federation of Independent Business. Wilson, it's a pleasure indeed to welcome you. Uh, thanks, Bill. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. What brings you back to the Midwest on this trip, Wilson? Uh, actually, Bill, we've been counseling with Ed Wimmer, uh, vice president in charge of public relations, and uh, we've been planning overall public relations activities for NFIB. You know, we had the pleasure, we meaning our U.S. Farm Report crew, in covering the recent uh, national NFO convention in Louisville, Kentucky, oh, yeah. of uh, filming Ed and hearing him, and uh, he's a most inspiring speaker, and uh, we love to uh, to hear him express himself on the problems of the independent businessman. He's your director of public relations, is that correct? Uh, Bill, that is correct, and Ed has done a tremendous uh, job for the Federation. Ed's philosophy, as I believe you know, is that if we're going to have a strong rural America, that uh, you've got to have the farmer, the independent businessman, and the independent bankers working together as an effective team. Yes, indeed. What exactly is the Federation, uh, Wilson? Would you explain it to our viewers? Uh, Bill, I'll be delighted to do that. The Federation is a nationwide nonprofit organization. We have over 276 thousand members. Uh, basically, we alert independent uh, businessmen. We have many thousands of farmers who are very active in participating as members of the Federation. Uh, we alert them on key pertinent business legislation that's coming up for congressional study. We provide a very simple device whereby the businessmen can indicate if they're either for or against uh, these, uh, uh, these pieces of business legislation. We provide a very simple ballot so that uh, these businessmen uh, express their opinions, and that's funneled in to members of Congress. This way, these men on the Hill have the pulse of business thinking in their congressional district before they are compelled to make a decision. It's about as democratic as apple pie is American. Wilson, as I have told you, I belong to this organization. I'm proud to belong, and I have found it very enlightening and most interesting. I find through the mandate that I get a feeling of, uh, indeed, some influence in the matter of that kind of legislation that is being considered in Washington affecting pro or con the independent businessman, and I get a voice. Wilson, I wonder if you would be so good as to explain in great detail for our viewers what the mandate is all about. Bill, I'll be delighted to do it. Uh, we maintain a very competent legislative staff in Washington. The members of our legislative staff uh, review carefully the uh, various pieces of legislation 
and they select uh, each month those that are more pertinent to business. On our mandate, we serve up five proposed bills that are coming up for congressional study, congressional consideration. Uh, we list uh, in careful detail the pros and cons, and then we provide a very simple ballot so that a businessman can indicate if he's either for or against, or in some inst instances, no opinion. Uh, also on this ballot, if he wishes to give additional detail, he can also comment. There's a space uh, where he can comment mm -hmm. to both his congressman and his governor. Where does the ballot go? Uh, we have uh, across the country about 2,300 district chairmen. These are businessmen who serve on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. These ballots are mailed in to a local chairman who in turn tabulates them on forms that we provide he sends a copy of that tabulation uh, directly to the congressman with one copy of the ballot. He sends another copy of the tabulation with the other ballot to the governor. And then he sends us a carbon copy so we in turn can put together a nationwide summary. And our testimony, our follow through uh, in Congress with the congressional committees and government agencies is based entirely on the results of that nationwide survey. Well, now the congressman, <coughs> the governor, whomever receives uh, these tabulated figures must necessarily pay some attention to those figures because these figures do not represent one, two, or a half a dozen businessmen. They represent, in fact, in the case of the Federation, 276,000 businessmen. Uh, Bill, that is exactly true. And uh, for the last several years, we have been by far and away the most frequently quoted in the congressional record of any business organization in America. And I'm sure the fact that it is a democratic process, members of Congress know that these ballots represent the pulse, the thinking, the mm -hmm. convictions of their own business constituents accounts primarily for that fact. Wilson, can you mention uh, some of the Federation's uh, legislative accomplishments? Uh, yes, uh, we were given a great deal of credit for getting SBA, the Small Business Administration, set up on a permanent basis to assist the former and independent business. As a matter of fact, uh, President Eisenhower gave our Vice President, Mr. Berger, the fountain pen that he used in signing that bill. Also, the 7% investment credit, we have been quite active in that over the years. Mm -hmm. Again, Bill, as you know, this has been tremendously advantageous to both the independent businessman and the farmer. Back in 1965, President Johnson asked that that be deleted because of the cost of, of the Vietnam War. We asked that it should be retained as an incentive for the farmer and the independent businessman, both of whom have been caught in a squeeze insofar as a reasonable margin of profit. At that time, it was cut back to 20,000, and we do feel that uh, it was extremely advantageous to the independent businessman and the farmer. Uh, recently, as you know, that has been deleted, and frankly, our own candid opinion, based on the thinking of independent businessmen across the country, is that that was a mistake in view of the squeeze with the high cost of money, uh, taxes, labor, and overhead that they're being plagued with at the present time. Yes. I'm sure that you know about the exodus of the independent farmer. I think uh, figures indicate that some 2,500 independent family-type farms are going by the wayside every week in this country. Now, of course, those independent farmers support the rural businessman, and so he is going too. And I'm just wondering if, in the Federation, you are uh, seeing this kind of exodus uh, in small business. Uh, yes, Bill, we are, and it isn't healthy for the overall nationwide economy. Actually, uh, the situation that is plaguing the uh, farmer is also plaguing the average independent uh, businessman. I think both of these uh, groups are paying a pretty high price for the privilege of trying to be independent and to uh, realize a fair and equitable margin of profit. Uh, the cost of uh, money today, the cost of labor, uh, the uh, cost of taxes is plaguing both of these groups to a point where they feel that they are not realizing a reasonable margin of profit for the time, the effort, the headache, and the capital investment. You mentioned something a little while ago that I found most interesting, Wilson, and that was an overlapping support. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there were a number of farmers who belonged to the uh, National Federation of right. Independent Business. And by the same token, uh, numbers of independent businessmen 
who are supporting farmers through membership, for example, in an F MFO. Uh, yes, Bill, this is very, very true. We have many thousands of farmers. By the same token, uh, we know that uh, many thousands of independent businessmen do support uh, NFO, and I think this is exactly as it should be. Uh, the independent uh, businessman in rural America is very much aware that he is not going to uh, continue in uh, uh, a healthy uh, state unless the farmer is also getting a fair price for his farm products, which he has not been getting in recent years. I have two brothers uh, who are farmers, and I know that they have been paying more and more and more for farm equipment and yet the cost of farm produce has not escalated proportionately, and this is also the problem with the average businessman. He uh, is being plagued uh, with the high cost of money, taxes, labor, and the overall uh, and overhead cost, and he is simply not uh, realizing a fair margin of profit, even as the farmer is not getting a proportionate share for what he produces. Well, now, with NFO, representing the farmer and uh, successfully, particularly this last year, bringing about a rise in prices paid for farm commodities. Does uh, the independent businessman through uh, your organization get this kind of help? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Bill. Actually, uh, we cover virtually all of the key pieces of business legislation that's coming up for a congressional study, a congressional uh, consideration. Once we get the uh, thinking, the pulse, the convictions of uh, the businessmen, and as I said earlier, many farmers who participate as members of the Federation, then we follow through to make sure that congressional committees and key men in government understand the problems of our members. And in many instances, I'm glad to report that they are giving more and more consideration to those problems. I overheard my colleague and good friend Phil Allen mentioning that in a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, the subject of small business or independent business failures and new business starts was covered. Would you comment on that? Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, uh, the last year especially, Bill, uh, we have uh, been getting more and more concerned, uh, for example, with the high cost of money. Uh, most independent businessmen use barred capital, even as the average farmer uses it. And uh, these uh, businessmen who are already working on a very low margin of profit feel that this is just another squeeze. Also, uh, we find with the cost of labor, as again, I think uh, the farmer is feeling that same problem. Uh, with, the, with the escalating cost of labor, it again adds a, an increasing burden to the independent businessman and I think also the farmer throughout the country. Wilson, on your current trip, you and your colleagues have visited national headquarters of NFO in Corning, Iowa. What impression did you come away with? Uh, Bill, uh, frankly, I had uh, very good reports prior to coming to the headquarters of NFO. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm here because of those reports. I'm delighted to say that I have been extremely pleased. The efficiency of the organization, uh, I think, is just uh, tremendous. One thing that I'm especially impressed with is the fact that uh, NFO does not have any business, nor do they sponsor any business, other than the welfare of the farmer. And I sincerely believe that this uh, accounts for the tremendous progress and the growth that uh, NFO has made. Uh, I believe that uh, this is the single uh, most outstanding impression that I've gotten. You know, I suppose that your organization suffers as NFO and many other organizations suffer who are trying to do a big job with a certain amount of complacency among uh, your members. Do you have this sort of problem in the Federation, the let George do it attitude? Uh, yes, Bill, we do. I think the two uh, biggest problems that uh, confront us as an organization perhaps uh, would apply also to NFO. In my candid opinion, I would say they are ignorance and complacency. <clears throat> A lot of people are afraid of things they don't know too much about. That's why uh, some individuals are afraid of the dark. They're not sure what's there. 
I am sure that if more farmers understood the uh, thorough operation of NFO, that uh, they'd be vitally more interested. Wilson, I presume the very same thing can be said of the National Federation of Independent Business. Uh, yes, Bill, it surely can. We have identically the same problem. We alert independent businessmen uh, with all of the key pertinent business legislation that's coming up for a congressional study. Much of this legislation not only affects the overall business economy, but it affects the cash register, the net profit of every independent businessman in America. So for his own protection, the independent businessman should be vitally concerned, and he should be taking the time and the interest to express his convictions and to use his fear of influence. You heard us referring earlier in our discussion to Mr. Ed Wimmer, who is vice president of the National Federation of Independent Business in charge of public relations. A very vital, energetic, outstanding man and an excellent speaker who was featured at the recent national convention of NFO in Louisville, Kentucky. Ed Wimmer addressed a special meeting on public information without doing any of those things, and you're doing some job of selling. And you know, you've got to have communications. Sometimes it backfires. A young couple had a, a boy parrot, a girl parrot, and all this parrot would say was, let's neck. As soon as they'd come home to, from work, the parrot would say, let's neck. Well, the preacher came over, and all during the, di the dinner, why the parrot kept saying, let's neck, let's neck. So he said, you know, can't that parrot say anything else? They said, no, we haven't been able to trade it anything else. Well, he said, that's funny, I've got a boy parrot, and all he can say is, let's pray. I think you ought to bring her over to my house and see if we can't get her to say something besides let's neck. So they took the cover off of the cage, and the little girl parrot looked up at the boy parrot, and she says, let's neck. And the boy parrot says, at last, my prayers are answered. <laughs> I'd like to uh, read you something here that I think is a prayer. <laughs> Rural America begins here and rolls on from open fields where children play to thriving villages, new towns, small cities where children go to school and grow up. Rural America's vigorous new community stretching across county lines, breaking old boundaries and forming new social and economic patterns adapted to technological change. But rural America today is also abandoned farms, disappearing small towns, where there are no jobs for nearly half the youngsters reaching working age, where nearly half the nation's poor struggle for existence. Rural America is changing, and change is bringing new problems, problems of inadequate schools, outmoded community and health facilities, insufficient means of transportation, and fragmented planning. Now, who said this and who put it in the paper? Well, if I had a couple of my private utility friends down here, they wouldn't want me to, to give this, but it's America's Rural Electric Systems ran that in a full-page ad. While U.S. Farm Report cameras were documenting the 1969 convention, I talked with another man who is vitally concerned with the problems of rural America, NFO Legislative Representative Harry Graham. Well, as you can tell, ladies and gentlemen, it's business as usual on the convention floor here in Louisville. Mr. Graham, uh, you were scheduled to speak to the convention yesterday afternoon, but as is often the case with conventions, the, uh, the agenda got a little behind, so you spoke this morning. That's right. And uh, what was your subject this morning? Well, mine was uh, generally a report on uh, the legislative work that we've done in Washington and uh, a brief report on what we do in, in the field of the administration of farm policies to see that they work the way they're designed to do for the benefit of agriculture. What about the uh, Farm Bureau program? Would you uh, comment on that for our U.S. Farm Report audience? Well, I think the Farm Bureau program is dead to all intents and purposes. It's been abandoned by the administration at about five or six uh, particularly important points. The massive land retirement, which was the center of it, has been abandoned. Uh, the uh, commodity programs, that they wanted to do away with has been retained. Uh, they want to reduce the uh, expenditure for commodity report programs. Uh, this has not been done. Uh, they have wanted to, uh, uh, they wanted to uh, 
we're going to substitute a rolling base uh, as a basis for the support programs. And the secretary told us yesterday that this has been abandoned. So the basic part of their bill has been lost mm -hmm. just what, by a lack of support. Yes. What about the uh, coalition program, Mr. Graham? Well, uh, just by process of elimination, then the coalition bill uh, becomes stronger as it goes along because uh, it has stood exactly opposite to what the Farm Bureau wanted. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, if they don't have administration support of the Farm Bureau bill, that's for sure they can't pass it. Mm -hmm. Which means that uh, in the process of elimination, the, the administration has to come pretty close to the coalition bill. And I think they will on most of the issues. Uh, the set-aside program still up for grabs. Uh, cotton is, uh, is not quite as uh, certain as uh, we wish it was because cotton boys can't agree on what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think there will be a, an, uh, uh, something done on the administration's uh, desire to have a, some kind of a rural uh, relief or rehabilitation or development program and uh, the coalition bill doesn't have it in their program, but we've always supported this anyway. Yes. So uh, the administration is going to come out with some of the things they wanted originally. They're not going to insist on all that they wanted originally. They haven't planted their feet in concrete, for one thing. The administration's been uh, amenable to some uh, uh, compromises as we've gone along, and, uh, and uh, they're willing to learn, and we're willing to learn too, but... Uh, we think we've had more experience with these programs than some of the people who just came in with the administration yes. because they don't have background on them. And we've been wooling these things around now for about Long seven time. or eight years, and, and we know where the bugs are. We know there's weak spots in it, but uh, uh, I think we're going to come out basically the program which we had, which is the coalition bill. Well, at least, Mr. Graham, the administration indicates it's willing to listen. Well, yes, and, and this has been pretty obvious most of the time. The secretary at the beginning of this administration indicated that he did not intend to send up a farm bill as such. They would send up certain broad outlines as uh, it went along, and uh, they have done that. And then they've asked the uh, people who are interested to help them, as they say, put the meat on the bones. And uh, we've been changing some of the bone structure yes. and putting some meat on the bones and the rest of them. The administration has has pretty well committed itself to, as far as possible, the maintaining of farm programs, uh, not a farm program, but farm prices and farm income. And uh, uh, they've had to take a close look at some of these, uh, these programs to see what they would have done to farm income, and when they didn't do that, they've abandoned them. So I, I think they've been uh, objective and flexible and, and thoughtful on this. A little slow, perhaps, but we still got some time left yes. before a uh, deadline, and it's been a really uh, democratic operation the way this thing has developed. All over the country, uh, Mr. Graham, we of U.S. Farm Report get the impression that support of NFO in terms of membership is growing. We get the impression that opposition is diminishing. We get the impression that uh, NFO's prestige is on the rise. Now, you're on the firing line in Washington, legislatively. Uh, what is your feeling about the general Washington attitude toward the National Farmers Organization? Well, I think it's the same thing. Uh, the first law of politics is that a, a politician learns how to count. They're aware of what's happening out in their districts. Yes. And when they, they think that we represent a majority of their, the people in their district, or even a substantial minority, uh, they're willing to listen to us, not just because we're right, but because we're so many. And uh, this is the way democracy works, fortunately. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, it would be uh, wonderful if they'd always think we're right as well as numerous, but uh, uh, this is expecting too much in the democratic process. And, the, and we disagree about some things, obviously. This is a part of democracy. But nevertheless, uh, I don't think it's a question, but they know that we're in the business. Uh, we had the interesting example of a couple of weeks ago, one congressman in a district where we got into a wrangle over the uh, grain sorghum recall, sitting in the television audience answering questions for a couple hours, television studio answering questions for a couple hours and advising the people to join the NFO and hold their grain sorghum. Yeah. And uh, this was a man who wasn't particularly favorable to what the NFO was trying to do about four years ago.
Have you enjoyed the convention so far? Oh, I always do. These are live ones. They really are. <laughs> this is something different convention. There's nothing like it in the farm scene anywhere. I just wonder if there's anything like it on any scene. I think the older labor conventions used to be this way. But uh, these, these, these are a bunch of swingers. They're, they're really live. It's, uh, maximum interest. I don't know any other convention where 10, 12,000 people will come and sit as long as they sit here and be alive on every issue that comes up. It's this fantastic. Is a, this is almost a resurrection of the old town meeting, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Uh, it has its only counterpart in farm history in the original Granger movement. There was the same protest, same dedication, same intense feeling. Uh, and same sense of injustice, yes. and, and it's here. It's, uh, we roll history back about 100 years and repeat it. Right down on that floor is democracy at work. Oh, it sure is. We heard some applause just a minute ago uh, where one fellow had taken the democratic processes here as far as he could and finally recognized he was beaten and got up and withdrew his motion and got a big hand for it. Now we're off on another one. And, uh, but it is uh, uh, very much a democracy and open democracy, too. As you know, and uh, most uh, most farm organizations in a situation like they've had here today on constitutional bylaws, and the open question period last night, they would have excluded the press. Oh yes, but they didn't. No, no. no this they is did not. this is done out in front of God and country. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> we wash our dirty linen, but uh, people can see what goes on, and 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 they ought to have confidence in an organization like this that's open and above board. You know what somebody told me about you, Mr. Graham. I wouldn't have any idea. No, I've heard a number they, of opinions. I'll tell you what they told me. <laughs> they said, I want to tell you something about Mr. Graham. You go to Washington to see him and start talking about the farm legislative situation, and he'll walk your legs off. <laughs> well, there's a lot of miles in that capital, and especially if you're trying to cover both houses at the same time. And, there are. Uh, when I'm up there, I wear my rubber sole, crepe sole <laughs> shoes. Your legs can get so tired, and walking on that slick marble the end of the day, you wonder if somebody's been beating on the calves of your legs. This has been most enjoyable. We want to thank you for well, your appearance on our show. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you very much. Wilson, may I thank you very much for taking time to be a guest on U.S. Farm Report. Bill, it's been a genuine pleasure. I've enjoyed the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My special guest on this week's U.S. Farm Report has been Mr. Wilson S. Johnson. Wilson is president of the National Federation of Independent Business. He comes from San Mateo, California. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week. Until we meet again, so long, everybody.